All right, all right, all right. What a wonderful morning to be alive. That's exactly what we are. Chris Courtney here, New Pragmatic. So good to be back. Um, it is, um, it's a wonderful, beautiful, you know what? It's a, it's a beautiful morning outside here, here in Chicago. It's just gorgeous. It's one of those mornings where it looks like, man, man the sun is so bright. The future is so amazing. Nothing could be possibly wrong in the world. And obviously you know what everybody's talking about out there. Um, it's one of those surreal times. Um, I remember specifically 10 years ago, I was, uh, I was really sick, like had cancer sick. And I remember leaving the hospital after one of my doctor visits and kind of looking around and it was like, nothing seems out of place. Looks, windows are down, the air feels nice on my skin. Like, you know, just a nice summer day. And, um, but yet there was this thing that was lurking, kind of something bad's right around the corner. And I experienced an amazing period of personal growth where I just kind of sunk my head into my job. Uh, I sunk my, my head into all things not related to illness and, um, uh, and I came out of the whole process. Um, it, that was that was when I learned how to code through that period of time. That's when I finally I, I shed my fear of code a decade ago. Um, there was a point in time where I was just fearful of anything involving websites or any of that stuff. And um, I, because I was designing for mobile apps at that point in time, but I did not know how to code. And, um, you know, that, that period of time is when I broke through and we may be coming upon a period of time where things are going to be kind of crazy outside of your immediate sphere. I invite you to come, come right here. I'm not going anywhere. We're going to be here every single, every single weekday doing the feedback loop, constantly working on our craft, constantly growing. And I want you to know that that's here for you. Okay? So whatever whatever's happening out there, don't worry about it. We'll focus on our craft right here. We will we will iterate ourselves up and through it. You know, world's not going away. It's just going through some things. So, I wanted to say that because it, it did it did dawn on me as I was taking the kid to school this morning. I'm like, man, this world's kind of crazy and everybody's worried about things and looks fine there's it's a beautiful day but there's something lurking around the corner focus on building your craft take take all that worry and put it into your work you'll 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 look up and everything will be everything will be settled when you get to the other side of it so i wish i could do that with politics anyway um i digress there's lots of great 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 work to look at this morning there's, there's a lot of great conversations to be had um, I, I, Rebecca. Hey, by the way, Rebecca, I'm just going to clap. I'm not going to say, I'm not going to say anything that jinx anything. Okay. I'm just going to clap. Okay. Cause I know you've been, you've been busting your tail interviewing and I'm, I'm just going to clap. I'm not going to, we're not going to say anything. Um, we may, we may say something later, but we are not, not, not right now. We don't, we don't, we don't celebrate yet. Um, that said, got work in from Eve, got questions from Tedgel, um, got questions from Rebecca, and Kara actually had a question about Stark. So I'm going to start there because Stark is a plugin that we utilize in the Color for Accessibility uh, chapter, and um, it dawned on me that that was one of the that was one of the uh, videos that I that I recorded that I forgot to record my screen. So it was very much me explaining how to use the tool, and you would you're seeing the video you're seeing right now. Except, it, I was intending to show you how I'm using the tool, and it didn't record my screen. So um, I'll start there this morning because that should exist already. Uh, let's go ahead and jump on in. So 
with that said, we'll come back to all this LinkedIn fun because uh, Rebecca's got some questions and Tejil, I know that you're going to have some questions in this space, but we are going to hop right over here and I'm going to, I'm going to use the color for navigation exercises, which is a little bit further downstream. So I'm not going to use the accessibility exercises. I'm going to use color for navigation and color for navigation has some accessibility issues built right on in. So there's some there, you know, when we're talking about interface design, everything that we're doing, even though we're, we're utilizing, we're pulling on different levers, everything we're doing along the way is intended to be building on top of itself. So if you, if you're, you know, this is color for navigation, we're going to use the principles we use in color for accessibility to color for navigation. But right here, we're looking at, you know, I'm going to look at the search bar. And if I, if I get down here to this placeholder label, um, if I were to run Stark on this, which I'm, I'm going to go down, down to my plugins, and just, just so you know how, how I got to that, I clicked option control, or, or control, I'm sorry. I clicked control and then used my mouse to get, get the um, drop down to pull up. And then I'm going to go in here to grab Stark. And I could do color applying, but I'm actually looking for co check contrast. And you'll see when that happens, Stark just like runs. And it's like, well, what's going on? I want to check the contrast on this. And it's because Stark doesn't know what to do with that because I'm, it doesn't know what I'm checking against. So I have to come through and check not only not only the, the element, I have to also shift click to select another another thing that I'm trying to check the contrast against. In this case, what I'm really wanting to do is I'm wanting to check the contrast of that type on top of the search field behind it. So now I will option click, go down to Stark, go to color, check contrast. And now it gives me the contrast checker information that I'm looking for. And as you can see, it's borderline. It's borderline because we have a double A rating, which is three to one for large text. It would fail in all other aspects. We always want the highest possible rating, the triple A, which is a, a higher criteria to get to. So what I'm gonna do in this case is I'm gonna come in and I'm gonna adjust, like this has a 60% opacity on it. I'm gonna adjust that up to 90. And now let's do the same exercise and remember I shift, I, I, I had that text selected and then I shift, I uh, clicked shift and then I selected the field behind it. I'm now going to hit control to pull up that drop down again. And there is a, there is a quick key for last plugin. So uh, that will trigger Stark as well. Um, because Stark has two, I'm unsure if last plugin will, will run just directly to the cut the contrast checker but I'm gonna see and it does and as you can see that adjustment now meets the criteria for start um, for start related to the contrast checker so that's how you utilize Stark um, there are many instances where the contrast will not be high enough and we want to identify those and design solutions for those before we get into code so that's the whole point of using the contrast checker is to make sure that any of the questionable usages that we have, and for the record, I've purposely designed those into these exercises so you can get some practice working through, okay, so what are the logic, what are the possible solutions here that also meet the accessibility um, requirements that are put forth by tools like Stark? They help us out, they, they help us see using somebody else's eyes I yeah you know before I even ran this contrast checker I could see that fine I mean 60% that was that was fine enough for me you know but th this is I'm not designing for me I'm designing for other people and when you're when you're designing for other people you need to th take their um, realities in mind, I, I, I bristle at the word limitation because that's to, to imply that there's something they can't do. 
but the, there is a there is a very real reality that other people have to live with and that's what we're really trying to get to is we're trying to recognize the reality of the people around us and make sure that we're, the things that we're building are useful or usable for as many people as possible so that said um that's that's stark uh Kara, I hope that is helpful. Um, if you have further questions, please let me know. But it really is just selecting the thing that you're wanting to check the con. Yeah, actually, I'm sorry. It's selecting the two things that you're wanting to understand the contrast relationship between. Um, it, it, you know, with without selecting two, it's very hard for Stark to know what what you're. You know, what is the contrast? But what am I contrasting against? Um, so you always need those two. All right, uh, let's go ahead and jump in. Um, let's jump in, you know, Eve. Eve has uh, submitted her uh, information design exercises. And hopefully that contrast checker thing uh, is helpful to you as well, Eve, because Kara is just ahead of you as she works through color accessibility. Um, Eve has worked through the information design exercises and the first one is design principles. And here you've noted that uh, proximity um, is present as well as similarity. Uh, one thing that I really loved was the way that Kara went about identifying um, where these laws are, because as, as you probably realize, many of these laws are present all at the same time. Um, but proximity, you know, anywhere that you have sections basically grouping information, like this information is all related by proximity as the nav bar is all, almost always related by proximity. Um, these items here th that have a clear label, they're related by proximity. Um, you know, this this is, uh, you know, when, when you look at just this type right here, that's all related by proximity. Uh, similarity, similarity is clearly holding this area together. Um, you could also say symmetry as well. Like um, anywhere that you have, like this text is very symmetrical, it's centered. Um, this entire unit here is centered as well. So, um, and then there's this whole idea of continuity. Uh, like if I click on any of those nav items, they're going. I'm expecting them to take me to a place to a place that's related to that information. So that's that's where continuity comes into play. So while you while you've noted these two, I think we've we've also seen where other in you know other uh, Kara pointed out that figure ground is present right here. Um, you know, this information is in front of that image. So, so, you know, there's more than what you have noted here, but that's, uh, but you have, you ha did note a few, um, here you went through and obviously proximity similarity, uh, is screaming at us here. Symmetry is screaming at us here. Um, continuity is more of a where question. Um, and I'm... He said the bottom of the page or the images are slightly cut off. So, so yeah, I could see that. Uh, like this idea that, that um, if I, when I see that information cut off, it tells me that I could keep scrolling. Um, that's, that's not incorrect. Um, that is something that you need to think about when you're designing, uh, when you're designing your experiences. Um, you need to give people a hint that there's a little more to the screen in one direction or another. Like, you know, am I going to be rewarded if I try to scroll or is it just going to be the footer? Um, always, always try to hint like, you know, show a little nudge or show some color, or show a little slice of the typography. Um, you won't always be able to hit that because obviously people are on all sorts of different screens. Um, and uh, particularly with browser windows, you can shrink them and grow them. But um, one of the things I like to do is I like to really focus on mobile and uh, making sure that on uh, the standard, it, it, I say standard, but there is a common height to um, 
two mobile devices, there's actually two common heights. Uh, it, there's the um, iPhone 10 and I want to say it's the Galaxy 9 are very similar in height and, and width. And then the, the plus size phones, the phablets, if you will, um, um, phone tablets, um, those are also similar in height. Um, so, you know, with mobile, you can definitely target like, OK, I want I want to make sure that this information is showing up just a little bit at the bottom. Um, so let's keep going. Uh, proximity, like this stuff all works together. Similarity, like that, this. Uh, symmetry, you can like draw a line right down the middle and the stuff just all evens out. Um, I, I will go back and look at your text here. Um, I do think I'm going to, I do think I'm going to adopt Kara's uh, color coding though, because it was so, so smart. Um, yeah, and I'll, I'll put it in as, as an, as an example, like here's, here's how I want this, uh, here's how I want you to color code this. Um, so proximity, uh, proximity again uh, you know anytime you have these sections you know here's one section gathered by proximity and here's another one um, you know similarity you can make this you can this one is really following that law um, there's not a lot of similarity here um, there is movement here though like like the you know that's something that we haven't really talked about a lot is how the juxtaposition of elements can make can allow you to move through a design. Um, typically, when we talk about the when we talk about the eye tracking pattern, we we see people start up here in the upper left. Um, if if your primary language is English, you start in the upper left, and this is something Rebecca and I have talked about recently because she was designing a Hebrew site, and Hebrew reads right to left instead of left to right when you when your primary language start um, moves right to left you actually gravitate to the other side of the page so um, keep that in mind if you're ever doing any sort of translation work um, that's why a lot of uh, Israeli websites that feature Hebrew the logo is over here in the other corner um, but the reason why a lot of logos are here in the upper upper left here in here in the states is because our language reads left to right, and our eyes immediately go to the top left. You read across, that's where your navigation is. You come down, that's where your hero unit t t tends to be. You go across, that tends to be some sort of featured product shot, because we're reading right to left and we're moving down to the next bit of information. What's interesting here, though, is I might wand over this area, um, but when you look at it, when you look at it in, in its when it's zoomed out form, you really get a lot of movement from here to here, and it's because these are similar forms. And you actually move from this logo to this version of the logo to that version of the logo because your eye is encouraged to track that. Um, I don't think that this actually plays out in a browser the way that we're seeing it here. Because in a browser, the, this page like clips off like right there, you know, maybe right there. So, so you're you're definitely getting this movement because of similarity. Um, but you know, there's also a nice juxtaposition between the size of this typography and the size of this image here. Um, so just know that there's there's a bit of movement happening here. Um, our, our eye is encouraged to move around. For a for a couple of different reasons, um, but but I really like um, I really like how um, you identified uh, these laws that were in usage pretty much across the board. Let's go ahead and jump into part two of the exercise. Uh, this is all about constraints, and thank goodness you did the good thing. You paired up the right content together. Although, no love for the weekend. Come on. Come on, the weekend's great. Who doesn't love the weekend? Um, what I do like is I like the idea. You added this continuity factor into, into your solutions. Um, you, you know, this arrow, I'm guessing that, you know, I'm thinking about this in terms of, like, I'm on, my, I'm on a phone and I, like, tap that. And it probably slides over the album with all the tracks. 
Like you can see that movement, that continuity in the design with the way you had it. Here, you've you've done something slightly different with it. And and oddly enough, you were like, you know what? I have two ideas for what I'd like to do here. Um, and and you, you know, you smartly, uh, you, you've got the comments here. You've got the star rating. You've got the the album and the band name. You kind of switched around what what went in each of these each of these content spots, but you, you're still featured on the right content, but you have this, like, I'm gonna slide back and forth between albums. And this could be any collection of albums. It could be metric albums. It could be alternative albums. It could be albums from the 2000s, uh, in like a decade span. So so I, I like that, I like that forward moment, that forward thinking here um, that's pretty strong, and you're probably looking at this going, well, you know, here you could have you could have left it off and, and not really been missing anything, but here, you know, after you after you place the album, and by the way, I, I really like the, you know, I, I, you got to recognize that she's also got it on a very clean grid, ba you know, the baseline grid is in full effect here, so that's kudos. Um, also, you've you've put you know you've you've tr done your best to align this um, on a vertical grid as well. So um, grids all around. But um, the um, what you what you end up with the shape is un unless the album is going to go edge to edge in the full size, you've got these wings down the side that you're like, okay, well, what do I do with this? And and the addition of navigation elements to the each side is logical so I, I really I really like like what you did here um, and that's really it for part two you might notice there's a there's a slight bit of difference between uh, some of the if you've been watching feedback loop there's a slight bit of difference between the organization of this set of exercises and the organization of earlier sets of exercises and what I've done is I've broken these apart Mainly because I, I, what I found was the left rail here in Figma just got bloated with with uh, information. If you needed to ungroup things, it got really un, unruly when, when I didn't utilize pages effectively. So I'm trying to utilize pages effectively so that, so that this information is all separated out and it's easier to see the exercises. So... Just know that I've updated, I've went back and updated earlier exercises where we didn't have this usage of pages. Um, and they're all marked like exercise part one, part two, part three. Um, but I just wanted to point that out in, ca in case you saw like uh, Kara's submission from a few days ago, it wasn't broken down like this, but now I went back and retroactively updated those. Um, I'm constantly tweaking this thing because I always want it to get better as we go. Um, it, it, right, interface design. I'm, I'm just, I'm just geeky, geeky. I'm geeky about it. I, I really am. I, I, I really, really love just getting in and messing with fonts and colors and organization, and and trying to help communicate with, uh, with our users. So exercise three. Now, um, let's go in and take a look at this. Um, so exercise three, if we zoom in, um, we're, this is the exercise where we're updating, uh, an existing site. And this is quite common. This is one of the most common things that you'll be tasked with doing is, Hey, we've got all, we've got all these things that were created before you got here. And now we need to update, update them. Um, you're not going to create sites from scratch, uh, immediately, it, almost like, like when you get to a job, you will almost immediately be thrown into an existing project. Like, okay, we need to fix this thing. And a lot of times we, we, uh, we just assume that this is easier than building from scratch because, hey, all the stuff's already been figured out for you. When in fact, it oftentimes is harder than building from scratch because, hey, I've got these guardrails and I can't move at all. I can't just say, oh, this is not a great design. I just have to work within it. So that's what this exercise is all about. And, you know, the goal here was to 
design something that felt like it belonged in uh, in this Figma design. Um, so as we're scrolling down, you'll see we've got you know the intro, then we've got who the customers are, then we've got what the design features are, then we've got some resources, uh, then we've got prototyping and collaboration. As we were go coming down, it's this area that was added to the mix. And the way that this is designed right now is there is this, um, there's this box where um, two videos have been added to the home page. And it says, um, community, community produced content, learn resources for uh, Figma users, by, created by Figma users for Figma users, um, browse resources. I really think that this is a really nice, uh, really nice creation um, because I, mean, I did not give, I did not give or provide Eve with this content. So she created the label, she created the headline. The, the whole point is make it look like it fits in with the other elements, okay? Um, the question here is, do we, do we need the white box? Um, could, could we have gone through and simply uh, like left, you know, put these videos on a grid and shown them? Um, and the answer is yeah. The, the trouble here that Eve got into is, Eve, Eve, I feel like you were trying to make it work in the size that you were given. And, you know, the, uh, the, the trouble there is, as a designer, we're often kind of given, okay, here's, here's the space you've got to, you, you, you have to work within. And the thing we have to realize, and Kara realizes this because she does information she does information design in print, which is restrictive by nature. Um, pixels, pixels, digital design is not restrictive by nature. Um, you can always scroll. Okay. So what I'm looking for here is I'm looking for somebody to reach out, knock on the door, and say, "Hey, can I adjust the size of this box, or do I have to work?" Do I have to work in this box, or can I make it larger? And once you make it, once somebody, once you ask that question, they say, uh, "Sure," or they say, "No." I mean, you, you don't know what they're going to say until they, until you ask. But you, if, if you ask that question, and it comes back that, "Yeah, you, you've got more space," what would you do? If I, if I said you could use, you know, if you get, you get up, yeah, you know, yeah, we can add up to like. 200 more pixels to that, to that box, to that section. Knock yourself out. The question is, what would you do? Um, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but I am going to say that the the white box on the background, that like that breaks it apart for me from what's going on down here. There is no like white box around the, the illustration. Same thing here. It's like everything everything's being shown. The, the one outlier here is there is a box that has an element inside of it here, but that's not, that, that is its own illustration um, as part of a larger element. It's not like off to the side. So my question is, if I said you could make this box larger, what would you do? So I'm gonna kick that back because I want, I want to take another spin at this. All of this, great, love it, that's fantastic. But if I gave you 100 more pixels, would you have to use the box or 150 more pixels, whatever it is that you need? Would you have to use the box or would you come up with a different design? Uh, because the box right now is, the box feels like, uh, I don't have space for three things. I have, uh, two things is too little. I'll put it in a box and I'll use the box shape to do it. And also I would say if you're gonna use a box, I would go even on these like that, and then that means that these elements are gonna come further in, and then I would, you know, I'd make it even all the way around, just like you have it here, like you have it this even all the way around. I would do the same thing here, and right now, 
like this is closer to the edge than that and then there's a space in between so like the design inside of the box it, it's it's either we need to add more space or we need to adjust the design inside of this box so that it is more consistent okay so I'm gonna kick that back to you um, overall I like the I like the other work that you did here um, I really I really thought this was um, superior um, and that's weird it, it's it's so weird Eve this part is where I feel like most people like just face plant um, this part is a little, uh, sorry not that part um, this part is a little easier for most people but um, but but you you crush the part that like makes most people like throw up a throw up in their pants. Um, so with that, throw up in your pants. That's kind of interesting. I'm good. This coming up with all the terms today. Um, let's jump into career stuff. I like talking about career stuff. You know why I like talking about career stuff? I like people getting jobs. serious I'm absolutely serious um, I was I was asked why I stepped away from media because when I did media design I was uh, I was in a situation where hundreds of thousands of people saw my work every day because you know, when you work at a at a media site and you do an illustration and it, it ends up in print on the street corner, like somebody delivers your artwork to the street corner every day, or it ends up being featured on the homepage of a site that's seen by millions of people every day, like there there's like an ego thing to that. But you know the thing that I realized in uh, doing all that, I didn't make a single person one dollar in that endeavor put no food on the table for anybody other than myself when I did those things and when you get a job when you get you know when you land a freelance gig when you score the, the big promotion when you are able to launch a new career that is food on the table uh, for you and your family. And to be part of that is way more important than a million people seeing your illustration in the morning. That illustration doesn't feed anybody. It feeds me. But it doesn't go be any it doesn't go beyond that. So just so just know I really geek out on you landing a gig being able to do this as a profession. That's that's why we do it. That's why we do it. So Rebecca had some questions here and I'm kind of wanting to zoom in here because I see some things here up, up top. Um, so this is new text and it's so wide I can't really read it and optimizing user experience, user-centered interactions, products, content. And okay, so this is this content. And Rebecca had a question yesterday as she was, she's been applying for positions. And to her credit, she has many freelance gigs here and there. Um, but she also wants to land a full-time role um so we talked about like what was going on here with her work experience and previously she had this she had block listed and she's doing freelance work now and the freelance work that she's doing encompasses everything that was previously listed with block Except she's doing this and, and collecting money for it. And when you do freelance work and you're doing interviews and competitive analysis and um, um, and I'm not sure if you mean for that to be that or that. 
Uh, is that the mult? Is that when when you do more than one? Because so, I always think of it about competitive analysis, not whatever that is. Um, that that seems like the plural. I'm I'm just gonna Google that. Um, not really certain what I'm looking at here. Yeah, I guess the plural is it. Okay, that's fine. Uh, it's it's not it's not incorrect. How about that? Um, but we're talking a lot about what to do with this segment, and it looks like, for the most part, um, I do think that um, often work often working with uh, remote teams of designers and developers I think that's I think that's um, uh, I see you've moved it to the bottom in this item up here up top and I think that's fine um, you know the team collaboration thing is important but I think that if you if you're if you wanted to move it to the bottom so long as it's in there um, I might say um, you know, well, it's it's different. Like, if you said, I'm comfortable working with remote teams of designers and developers, that's something that you say more as a statement out, outside of what you did. This is what you did. You often worked with remote teams of designers and developers. So that's fact. Um, conducting user research, uh, competitive analyses, and writing UX product strategy, listening to lots of users during interviews and usability testing um, I don't know if that uh, like when you conduct user research interviews and, and compet I think that covers it I don't think you need need to list listening to lots of users like you've already I mean you, you said you conducted it so that's what you do when you conduct the research so um, I am looking at creating and optimizing user centered act interactions products and content using research um, okay so yeah um, you conducted the research yeah designing wireframes from sketching um, from sketching to high fidelity design um, it, mm, while producing prototypes and conducting a B testing mind mapping content strategy and micro copy that feels you know that feels odd I think what you have up here where it says writing user targeted content and, and highly interactive micro copy that's closer but um, writing user focused uh, well you got user centered user targeted um, you you know I struggle with that because I really don't want to get into the jargon of you target, you focus, you you center. You, you know, um, I, I think you, you, you know, writing writing UX writing UX content, writing for UX. Um, um, I don't know writing writing UX content um, in addition to um, microcopy for interactions that might be that might be a way to get us suddenly I had to look at my microphone to make sure it's plugged in <laughs> that might be a way to get us there so writing UX content um, and microcopy for for um, for interactions that might be the way to, to cross that chasm but I think I think any any of that's better than mind mapping content strategy and microcopy so um, that's how we tighten up that um, Tejal though actually sent us across her resume earlier and I'm just gonna 
just checking things out here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Rebecca sent, sent Rebecca sent across a little note. So um, you can see, hey, there's like lots of people here that you should recognize. Um, so when you're looking at your when you're looking at your LinkedIn profile, um, and I realize I've, I've kind of leaped over Tejal. I will, I promise. Uh, ah, ah, I promise. I will be right back there. Okay. Um, when we when we talk about our LinkedIn profile, Rebecca has some questions about hers, and one of the first things that I would encourage you to do is make sure you understand what your public profile settings look like. Um, there is a way to, to customize your URL so it is um, so it is focused on you. And I believe if I, if I squeeze over to, sorry, I gotta get Rebecca's over here. I believe she's done that. Yeah, she's, she's clearly Rebecca Bar Design. So, so she's, she's gone through and, and edited this. Um, so you can edit the content. Um, you definitely want to turn your profile on, um, for public visibility. That, that isn't something I think that, that is just automatic. Um, you can't control who sees it. Um, you know, who sees your profile photo, um, and whatnot. You I mean, there's lots of controls in here. Unlike Facebook, they do not tend to to uh, surprise you over time uh, with updates. This um, this about section is pretty interesting, and what I want you to really focus on is it's fine to have a long about section, but you want to make sure that this first sentence says something amazing because. When we look at this, you can see the about, it's, it's just that, okay? You can click see more, but how many people do? So I'm gonna refresh this because I wanna make sure we, we're focused on what that about page for, what that about graph says for Rebecca. Um, hi there, I'm Rebecca, uh, she's Rebecca, I'm not Rebecca, but I'm just reading it. Um, a UX CX focused digital and tangible product designer with a se with a senior level background in uh, retail wholesale manufacturing and e-commerce I was not yawning because I'm bored I was yawning because I had a late night writing content um, I like the emoji um, hi there I'm Rebecca a UX CX focused designer or er, focused um, I don't know. I, I almost would say a UX CX focused designer with a senior level background in tangible goods for retail, wholesale, manufacturing, and e-commerce. I think I think I would shift that tangible product to to your senior level background, like senior level background and what? Well tangible products so I can make real things um, I think that and that like decouples it sorry that, whoop, that decouples it away and allows them to stand separate from one another um, I really do believe that that that's a pretty good thing to do um, you, you may not agree um, and that's okay but for for me, I would def that's that's how I would break that up, and then what you say past there is really up to you. Um, I'm currently working as a freelance designer and consultant. I focus on building minimalistic, ethical, and transparent products and experiences that work both for you and your customers. Um, that work for my clients and their customers. Um, you know, the per anybody reading this is not necessarily your customer. They they need. I think I put that put that. You know, right now it feels like you're selling directly to them, 
And I think I think you always want to position it like, yeah, I'm very I'm very focused on my customers. Would you like to become my customer so I could be very focused on you? Um, like, I, I think there's this line like, hey, good to meet you. I love my customers. I, I, I could love you, but you've got to get over here in my bucket of customers. Um, if you have a project you think I might be I might be able to help you with, be uh, be in touch. Um, be in touch. If, if you have a project you think I might be able to help you with, get in touch. Um, let me know. Uh, I'm always ready to do good work. I'm always excited about the possibility of working with good people. I'm always excited about the, the opportunity to work on interesting projects like there's a lot of different ways that you can cut at that and I um, I don't think we've quite got it yet that that about section needs a little massaging um, <clears throat> I like seeing that you are active um, that's good so here we're back into UX UI product consultant, um, Rebecca Bar Design. This is where, where, wherever, you know, this is tough because if you adjust this to have multiple different approaches, it becomes very hard to, to adjust this as well for every different role that you're applying for. So I, I think, you know, what you have on your resume and what you have in LinkedIn should be as close as you can get it. Um, but I wouldn't just go over the top with, oh God, I got to change. I've adjusted the title for a particular job. Now I have to change it on my LinkedIn. That's just hard to continue. Um, or it's hard to chase down. Um, so product design. Hey, you have a recommendation. This is a big area that I think you can expand on. And it's one of the it's one of the common things that you'll see floating around if you if you read any at all about how do I how do I boost my signal? I need you to go through and give three recommendations to people that you've worked with in the past. Um, it can be recommendations on anything, but when you give a recommendation without having it request, without requesting one, the likelihood you're going to get a very nice recommendation in return is significantly, is very high. And you need people. It, it also signals to people like you might be looking around for a gig. Um, and that, that sparks conversations. So I would like to see you give deploy some some recommendations um from people who have not given you one like go you know um not sure oh you gave me one see you see how that works i gave you one on the 29th and you basically gave me one on the 29th so um so that back and forth was very good we need we, i need you to do that three more times with three other people that aren't me um, so that you can begin to build up the number of people who have recommended you. Because just seeing a recommendation from me, where I'm saying, Rebecca's tenacious, and you are, um, you, need, you need volume there, okay? So, so that's my two cents on that. I, I really do think that writing recommendations is tough. Um, so... Don't be surprised if it takes you a couple hours to like first identify who, then identify what you're gonna say, and then send it to them. Um, you know that that's a lift. Okay, it's not something that you just you don't you don't just sit down one morning and go I'm gonna write ten recommendations a day because it's so easy. No, recommendations are tough. So I, I do want you to I do want you to step out and and do that soon. Okay. Uh, one other thing I might might say is, I like the Vincent Van Gogh. Uh, I would like it more if it was just the painting. 
Um, I think uh, the typography being in there, it's busy. Uh, people will will get it. I would love to see you. It's one of the, like if you go over to mine, um, like I have I, I, everything's upside down with me. It's it's a branding thing, but I have myself in black and white here. But I have my, it's in color here. Um, I would love to see you in color some like here but I also understand like this is the image you're using everywhere so that's fine um, but I but I, I do think that I would probably just go like s without the text on the on the image and you can get this uh, you can get this uh, painting really from anywhere so consider it it's not a must but um, be sure to take a look at your public profile and what, and what you're broadcasting out there. Make some recommendations for, uh, for colleagues, and then, um, and then I think you you will be off to the races. Um, so that's just a couple things for today. We can continue. We can continue to refine this, uh, but I'm going to move over here to Tejil for a moment. So Tejil has. Um, her resume that she that she submitted and there's a few things here that I want to I want to focus on uh Tejil and it is that one this really needs to be one page okay and I know that that seems like what one page how how, how am I going to make it into one page um I squeezed 20 years into one page on, on my on my resume and a lot of it is you're going to have to consolidate a lot of this into a relatively short thing and I might just put it as, I might just put it in there as a pet paragraph like a short paragraph that doesn't get into the bullet points um, but gives you an opportunity to, to talk about the types of work that you did um, I, I might even, you know, I might even cut down on skills and maybe put clients. And it, here's just a list of the clients that I've worked with. Um, because a lot of your a lot of your work is for individual companies, uh, which makes this very hard to, to pull together. Um, so you've got, you know, ESPN and freelance and uh, education and awards and nominations and Another thing that I would probably do is I'd probably consider pulling this profile over to here. I would consider even getting rid of the logo. It's taking up a lot of space. Um, I would also consider getting rid of the screen and just using space. I'll show you an example of mine. And I show you this mainly. Um, well, I thought I had it. Yeah, here's mine. Oh, and there it is. So rather than getting into, um, rather than getting into um, blocks of color or grays, mine is very just black and white. I focus on typography. Um, I focus on baseline grid. Like if you go down, like you'll see it, it lines up here, right? But if you work across, you'll see that it lines up there, and there, and there. And this seems like it's just kind of floating out there, but it, you'll see it lines right back up here, and here. And the whole point is that your baseline grid, if you're doing it right, it will, it will sync up the, the horizontal movement of your page. Um, as you can see, uh, my bio is just below this imp this name and uh, website and whatnot. Strengths, I talk about what I'm really good at. Uh, education, references. Um, and I point people to my website because that's where I've listed references, awards, and things like that. Um, the, you know, this encapsulates you know, obviously I have not updated this because I'm no longer, I haven't been at Block in a long time, um, which is weird to think of. It's been, uh, but this is like 18 years. Yeah. So 20, uh, I guess, well, let's just say 
let's just say 17 years. So 27, uh, 2019 through 2002. And, you know, I was able to list out Los Angeles Times, Chicago Tribune, Chicago Blackhawks, WGN, KTLA, WPIX, LA Walk of Fame, Chicago Football, uh, Chicago Tribune Football Network, Astro Source. Those were like some of the clients that I worked for in that role. Um, and somehow I, okay. Um, this talks about responsibilities. This talks about, um, you know, building for various devices. Uh, so, you know, you, you get the idea. The, the point is, I think when you're, when you're looking at what, what can I do in here to tighten things up? One, it's get rid of this. If you get rid of the background, that immediately allows allows this some room to breathe. This area can go wider. Um, if you if you get rid of the background, this area can can come over. That gives you more space to work with. Um, if you get rid of the logo, or if you just move the logo to where it's just the T up here in the corner, that means that you gain a lot of space here on the side. Um, you've got contact and skills and all this re replicated. Um, I think that you could even probably slide up education and awards into this space. Um, I, I think that you can truncate the skills. Maybe it's, maybe it's two columns of information. Uh, you can truncate this into paragraph form. There's just, there's just a lot of tightening that can happen here. Um, I would encourage you to, um, would encourage you to look into, um, putting this in a form, like putting this into a Figma file where we can just begin hammering on it. Um, right now it's just, you know, it's, it's, um, you're in the very early stages of carrying this forward, but I do think that it's, it's a situation where, um, the format is it, it, it's over designed right now okay it's just over designed and when we start talking about applicant tracking processes uh, or ac applicant tracking systems an applicant tracker which is it, it, it takes a file like this and it tries to read it um, the a the AI is gonna spit this out as invalid because it's got a logo and I realized mine had a logo too I'll explain that in a second it has a logo it has uh, background it has some kind of weird type typographical usages um, the applicant tracking process or system is going to look at it and go I can't parse this I'm going to spit it back out um, one thing I'm, I'm advising people to do is to have their application ready to go in a simple word doc for s submission to applicant tracking process systems and and to have a designed version of their of their resume for in-person interviews, handouts, things like that. Um, I think I think we're in a world where you have to have both. I've I've tried I've tried to thread the needle and like oh we'll just remove the logo. Applicant tracking systems are still failing to read those, um, and and I I tested that out myself. Okay, I got the standard like oh you need to improve all these things because our system wasn't able to read your resume. Um, and the, the first big one is, you know, if you have any sort of image or any sort of color block, the applicant tracking system is going to crap out. So uh, welcome to the realm, realm of robot HR. That is what an applicant tracking system is. It's just, a, it's just AI trying to say, oh, this person used 65% of the keywords we're looking for, put them in the good pile. And it's so, it's like, Oh my God, really? Or is that where we're at? And that is where we're at. We're at the spot where they're doing keyword parsing on these resumes, looking for whether or not you line up with the job posting that you're applying for. So we have to think about, we have to think about this in, in those sorts of terms. But the first thing that we have to do is we have to get this in a form that an, an ATS can actually consume it. And right now, this isn't it, B mainly because logo, color block. So let's go with space. Let's make it black and white. 
and and let's get this in into shorter paragraph form so we can like we need to get this down to one page okay all right um you also had a question about how do you add ux experience since i haven't done any projects professionally um i think that i would probably slide that under studio t creative um, um motion graphics uh motion graphics does um motion graphics comma ux designer slash creative director um and then i would begin because you have this studio t creative it's your thing you it, it's whatever you want it to be um i would begin sliding my information under that um much like i've told rebecca get rid of the block thing it's, this is your freelance thing put it there and then as you expand the, you know as you expand as you get first freelance gig or the volunteer gig or the whatever you can then begin to build upon that but you've got this 2018 to present and you've worked on a lot of different projects i think that you can i think that you, you've done some ux work in there so let's talk about it okay but i would i would i would not make a new box above it and say ux designer three months and then start building i would build off the fact that you you know studio t creative is yours and you can do with that what you need to do um now don't stretch it too much like have that conversation when they ask like so how much ux have you done well it's something i've really started doing more recently and give examples of of stuff that you've been doing uh but don't like yeah i've been doing ux for two years that's that's not the point um we're not trying to we're not trying to portray you as somebody who's been doing ux the entire time um one of the things that i you know when i was at when i was in media um i started off as designer at red eye and then an illustrator and then a writer and then a copy editor and then a photographer and then uh i was creative director and it's like well the you know i could i could have like 15 titles here i just went with the top one i just went with the top one that i had um that doesn't mean i, I was creative director the entire span but how do i explain it otherwise unless i'm going to have like 15 listings for every time i i switch jobs at that at that place um so it's just it's a, you know you're expected to have this in one page okay uh if that's the case if you've got to boil it down to one page then you're gonna have to make some adjustments um so that's my two cents on it uh i i i want to see this come back through like i would love uh, make a figma make a figma file um let's take the first stab at it tedril and kick it back over the wall and then let's start let's start picking this part but i've given you some i've given you some rough guidance for what i would do to get this started now let's start having the back and forth okay all right ladies and gentlemen that is going to do it for this edition of the feedback loop um i really hope this has been helpful for everybody involved i, I absolutely love it when we get to get into deeper uh conversations about career um also i love seeing kara and eve diving into um diving into inter interface design i am a geek about all things visual design anyway because that's where i started um so i am always happy to uh have those uh have those kind of kinds of conversations around space and type and color and all the things that i've always been a big fan of so without further ado I will see you all again on Friday. Take care.